Morning. Thanks for coming along. Really grateful. This is um, obviously our pre-budget speech to prepare the um, ground for some of the demands that we're going to make in the budget next week. Um, next week, the Chancellor will stand up in Parliament to deliver his first and last spring budget. Um, he'll no doubt want to paint a rosy picture of progress since the autumn statement just a few months ago. But if progress has been so significant and all is going so well, why is the government continuing to pursue spending cuts? From the NHS to social care, from prisons to education, our public services, as you know, are in crisis. And Brexit will present challenges to this whole country as well. And Labour is prepared to meet all of those challenges. Yet instead of rising to the challenge, I fear the approach from this government on the economy is to continue the failures of the past. Look behind the headline figures and the real story is apparent to all of us. The essential facts on our economy remain as follows. Low investment over many decades has led to a low productivity, low wage economy. Insecure and poorly paid work dominates new job creation. That in turn means that the tax base needed to secure our public services is now less stable. Deliberate decisions by this government to privilege tax giveaways to the super rich and giant corporations have further undermined the tax base. The model, this model, is not sustainable. And the failure at national level is absolutely palpable. The Conservatives will soon have added three quarters of a trillion pounds to the national debt since they arrived in office. At the same time, they will have imposed the first spending cuts on schools for 40 years. And NHS, as you know, is in a state of profound crisis. Let me pay tribute to those who work in our public services and manage our public services. They've done their best under the austerity onslaught. And coming from a local government background, I tell you local authorities in particular have had to cope with the most extraordinary sharp funding cuts in recent history. They will not sustain a further round of spending cuts. So when the Treasury casually announces this week that it's looking for a further 6% of funding cuts to some government departments, it's an act, in my view, of gross irresponsibility. And the comments today you will have listened to on the radio from the head of the Care Quality Commission at the NHS, and I quote, stands on a burning platform, I think have driven home to all of us the scale of the crisis. Cuts to social care amounted to 4.5 billion since 2010 have brought the system to the brink of collapse. Over 1 million vulnerable elderly people now, including many who are very frail, now lack access to the care they need. This is one of the richest countries in the world, and yet Tory austerity has brought our public services to the brink. Social care now has a 1.9 billion deficit for this funding year. And this needs to be filled immediately to stabilise the system. And based on estimates by the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, the NHS and social care together face a funding gap of between 8.5 billion and 15 billion by 2020. Published figures indicate that tax receipts actually are currently higher than previously anticipated. So let me say this. Given the immediate crisis we're facing in the NHS and social care, I'm calling upon the Chancellor to use that money to address this NHS and social care emergency we're facing now. Any measure less than this is likely to be inadequate. But it's not just those who rely on our public services who have suffered under this government. The slump in living standards overseen by this Tory government is the worst this country has experienced since the Industrial Revolution. The Chancellor may try and boast about rising GDP, but that hasn't turned into real improvements in people's lives. The reality of our economy is that the average hourly, real hourly pay remains over 10% below its level before the crash. And that cuts to public services have now placed them, as the Independent Institute for Government has said yesterday, close to outright collapse. The record on living standards is the worst of any leading economy. Only Greece has seen a bigger fall in real pay. And Britain has the distinction of being the only large developed economy in which wages fell even as the economic growth returned after the crash. And now rising inflation as the government mishandles Brexit is devaluing people's wages even further. 
Yet the government has reneged on its promised national living wage level and is continuing to pursue cuts in in-work benefits, which will bite from April onwards. Analysis out this morning by the Institute of Fiscal Studies shows that low-income working families with children will suffer the most. And they predict that the average household will be £5,000 worse off by the end of this Parliament than they might have expected. If the economy is growing, the benefits must be shared fairly. The Chancellor must reverse the £70 billion giveaway to the super-rich and giant corporations between now and 2021. And the cruel £3.7 billion cut to personal independence payments for disabled people must be halted. Let me just come back to public services. On public services, from education to local councils to prison services and social care, they're all in deepening crisis. And the burden is falling disproportionately on whom? On women. It is women who are bearing the brunt of low pay, cuts to in-work benefits, and the public sector pay cap. Put together, this government has created a toxic mix. Independent estimates by the Women's Budget Group suggest that 86% of the cuts now in public spending since 2010 have fallen on women. The, the Chancellor must take action in the budget next week to fund our public services and end this form of discrimination. In place of austerity, Labour wants a budget that works for women, that invests for jobs for women, funds the services that women depend on, and advances women's equality and economic independence. Well, let's return to the NHS and social care. It's the NHS, the National Health Service, and our social care services that tell us the most about this government's failures. It's essential that the government uses this budget to give the NHS and social care the funding they urgently need. The present Conservative government has been condemned for its fast and loose approach to NHS spending. The Chief Executive of NHS England has dismissed government claims that current funding is adequate, let alone more than they asked for. The Public Accounts Committee has rebuked the government for raiding the NHS capital budget to meet NHS spending needs. The Health Select Committee has dismissed the government's claim on increased funding. So the reality is that the government has consistently failed to provide the funding that the NHS needs and it will continue to, to, continue to need in the future. Yet the rhetoric from the Prime Minister downwards has suggested anything but. There's an air of unreality about her claims that more and more patients are being seen by more and more doctors. You know the experience on the ground of patients, doctors and nurses is of a treasured institution already drifting into greatest, its greatest crisis in its history. The reality is that the Tories are imposing a real terms cut per head in healthcare spending. Current plans from the government do not come anywhere near close to addressing the scale of the crisis. So it's essential that they now bring forward plans to close the funding gap if we do not want to lose our NHS. Labour will never break from the fundamental principle that our National Health Service should be free at the point of use. And when we come into power, we will reverse Tory privatisation by renationalising the NHS. But it will require bolder steps to secure NHS funding where demand pressures are rising, confidence in government is low, but retaining NHS's historic mission of health care free at the point of delivery is a national priority. Public trust and confidence must be restored, not only in the government of the day, but in governments for the rest of this century and beyond. So recent discussions about, around long -term funding, the long-term funding future of the NHS have helped clarify some important issues. So I want to lay out the framework on how Labour will be looking to develop this thinking in the future. Yes, we want the immediate injection of resources in this budget into the NHS. But the financing of the NHS has become excessively politicised to the point where even supposedly official figures are subject to dispute. So there needs to be an independent adjudication of both needs and actual provision to restore public trust and confidence. The Office of Budget Responsibility has already taken steps to assess the long term, the, the levels of funding needed for the NHS in the longer term. And I've written to the Robert Choate to ask about the ability of the OBR to continue to provide these assessments as part of its overall brief to monitor the government's fiscal position. To change the OBR's responsibility and bring in permanent oversight on health care funding would require primary legislation from the government. Fair and objective assessments of long-term need are required along with close monitoring of actual spend being made. 
That's a bigger task than ministers can provide. So we need a political neutral body modelled on the Office for Budget Responsibility that can remove the question of long-term funding from the political squabbling. Only in this way can the public have confidence in the figures and confidence be restored. And yes, essential spending correctly be made. So secondly, we have to place funding for the NHS on a long-term basis. As Lord Macpherson and others have suggested, placing the NHS on a stable five-year financing basis needs that certainty of funding can be assured. But we need to do more in funding and tying it down for the length of a parliament is a step forward. But we view, view the fact that it needs longer-term stability. So that means the production of 10-year budgets rather than five-year budgets. Again, objectively assessed by the OBR. The pressures that we know of today will continue to build up over decades. We need NHS budgets that can assure funding on those timescales. Third, we must show those expected to pay for the NHS that their tax, their tax money is well spent. The simple truth is that after the financial crisis and years of failed austerity, governments are simply not trusted. Creative accountancy and stale taxes have helped chew away public trust in the system. And the fact that the wealthy can seemingly dodge their taxes at will has further undermined public confidence in the tax system. And politicians, to be frank, thinking only about the electoral cycle, have too many incentives to game the system. So people know, need to know that their contribution that they make will be spent properly. So hypothecation, allowing taxes raised to specific purposes, can absolutely make clear where that tax money is being spent. It can help restore the trust and confidence in taxation and government spending that has otherwise started to break down. But hypothecation has to, for the NHS has to be more than a commitment from a politician or a political party to spend a given amount, however firm that promise. It needs a clear commitment over the longer term that specific ta taxes will be used for specific purposes and this spending will be properly monitored. That's the system we are urging to be put in place. Let's go on in terms of the government's rhetoric. The government's rhetoric on the economy has changed profoundly over the last year. They're catching up with some of the positions we've staked out. The Chancellor claims he now accepts the need for government to invest rather than to slash investment. He just won't deliver on it, though, will he? And the Prime Minister has offered fine words about, and I quote, good that government can do. And yet her government has actively pursued any excess spending cuts that have contributed to 30,000 excess deaths a year. They're not my figures. Those are the figures of the Royal Society of Medicine. And the disconnect between what ministers say and what they do has reached dramatic proportions. And the reason for that disconnect is clear. The Tory party knows that after years of austerity and sliding living standards, the sentiment against political elites out there in this country is palpable. That mood was a critical factor in the vote to leave the European Union last year. This government has sensed the mood and adapted to circumstances. They've borrowed the rhetoric of protest and now pose as the champions of the workers. Only five months ago, the Prime Minister and their Chancellor were given the impression that austerity was coming to an end. But much of the austerity, as you know, is yet to come. In the end, the Tory leadership are the elite. So they can make all the grand promises they wish, but they can't deliver the transformation our economy now needs. They don't have the political will to do it. Labour's already begun to lay out its alternative. We want to break with the past, not a continuation of its mistakes. So the fundamental task of any reforming government in the future will be to rebuild and reconstruct our economy. Our fiscal credibility rule and commitment to invest means that the next Labour government will break with the failures of the past. We will bring down the deficit while committing real government resources to increase investment. By the end of the next Labour government, the national debt relative to trend GDP will be lower than what we will inherit. We'll reverse years of underinvestment across the whole country, not just in the few existing centres for growth and prosperity, but delivering the funding that's needed to our, so that our smaller towns and communities can share in that prosperity. The great divide between London and the rest has to be overcome as well. And we'll introduce legislation to correct the bias in investment funding for the regions. 
will commit the funding needed for specific infrastructure investments, like the £10 billion for Crossrail for the North and the new tidal lagoons that were being planned. Labour is committed to delivering one million new homes and building a new generation, yes, of council housing. And we need a government prepared to give back control to our localities. So alongside the National Investment Bank, the next Labour government will create a network of regional development banks that will supply the funding needed on the ground for local businesses to flourish. We can allow workers and those wishing to set up and run their own businesses the opportunity to take control back away from the boardrooms where short-term decision-making has dominated. And yes, the railways will be renationalised by Labour. But we'll also introduce a right to own for workers, giving them the first refusal on taking control of companies undergoing a change of ownership. And we'll use the regional development banks to support a new generation of cooperative businesses, at least doubling the size of the cooperative sector. Small and new businesses will be properly supported with reforms to the business rates, financing from the regional development banks and support for business hubs in every major town and city allowing new businesses to work together and collaborate. We'll support investment by manufacturing firms by removing plant and machinery from business rates. And we'll reform corporate governance laws to block raiders trashing profitable companies and bankrupting pension funds. We'll want our large corporations to work for the public good, not against it. So we'll also introduce a fair pay ratio to stop top bosses paying themselves excessively. But to reverse the slide in living standards, we'll need to do more. Labour's real living wage will be £10 an hour minimum, meaning work will always pay properly and the public sector pay cap will be lifted. We'll also restore trade union rights and repeal the Trade Union Act. And we've fought. We've fought to defend the rights of EU migrants here who contribute so much to our public services and our economy. As you know, the law's passed the Labour's amendment and we urge the government now to immediately bring forward a guarantee to protect the rights of EU nationals resident here. And we're working now with our European colleagues to protect the rights of EU citizens here, but also UK citizens in the EU. And of course, we'll halt the austerity cuts to in-work benefits and payments to people with disabilities. We'll need a clear, clear plan for government to intervene on, major, on a major scale, supporting essential industries, fostering new sectors, and above all, creating decent, secure jobs across the whole country. And we'll use the power of government procurement backed up by the National Investment Bank to deliver a massive expansion of industries like renewables where the global potential is enormous and our natural resources so significant. The next Labour government will break the cartel of the big six energy companies by creating the conditions for local, decentralised, low-carbon energy by supporting local authorities and cooperatives on these initiatives. We'll follow the German model. We'll target 3% of GDP on scientific research from all sources to deliver on the huge potential of our scientific research base. And from being a laggard in research spending, we'll move to being a leader. We can't run first-rate public services on a second- or third-rate economy. But we can't pay for the first-rate public services unless the tax system works fairly and effectively. There will be no place to hide for tax avoiders and evaders under Labour. Our tax transparency and enforcement programme will clamp down on the worst avoiders. And building on the successful Nordic model, we will introduce legislation to make the public the tax returns of those earning a million pounds a year. Transparency and fairness is at the heart of building a decent and open society. We believe this will help restore public trust in the tax system and help clamp down on any avoidance. This programme of structural reform shall all be taken as fundamental. This is in outline so far the economic programme of the next Labour government. It represents nothing less than the transformation of this country. We don't, we don't have to settle for the steady management of decline under the Tories. And we don't have to accept the failings of an elite that have led us into a decade of falling living standards, insecurity and failing public services. There's enormous potential here in every part of this country, and we can build a radically fairer, a radically more democratic and more prosperous society. We can together turn this country round. That's our mission. Thank you very much. Morning. Thanks for coming along. Really grateful. This is... Um, Obviously, our pre-budget speech to prepare the um, ground for some of the demands that we're going to make in the budget next week. 
Um, next week, the Chancellor will stand up in Parliament to deliver his first and last spring budget. Um, he'll no doubt want to paint a rosy picture of progress since the autumn statement just a few months ago. But if progress has been so significant and all is going so well, why is the government continuing to pursue spending cuts? From the NHS to social care, from prisons to education, our public services, as you know, are in crisis. And Brexit will present challenges to this whole country as well. And Labour is prepared to meet all of those challenges. Yet instead of rising to the challenge, I fear the approach from this government on the economy is to continue the failures of the past. Look behind the headline figures and the real story is apparent to all of us. The essential facts on our economy remain as follows. Low investment over many decades has led to a low productivity, low wage economy. Insecure and poorly paid work dominates new job creation. That in turn means that the tax base needed to secure our public services is now less stable. Deliberate decisions by this government to privilege tax giveaways to the super rich and giant corporations have further undermined the tax base. The model, this model, is not sustainable. And the failure at national level is absolutely palpable. The Conservatives will soon have added three quarters of a trillion pounds to the national debt since they arrived in office. At the same time, they will have imposed the first spending cuts on schools for 40 years. An NHS, as you know, 